right shoe yeah. on the tape. Careful with those shoes. Yeah. This is never has there been a bigger mismatch when it comes to shoe game. Hey man, well let's see, he doesn't. Nice he ones. clearly doesn't have to overcompensate for personality shortcomings. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what you're doing. Do you have much of a shoe game? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I have a lot of shoes. Yeah, you want me to hear? yeah I don't. I don't really do. Um, I guess I do a little bit of fashion, do shoes, but that's pretty much all I like buy. No, that's how you burst on the scene, and now I'm. I imagine you're getting a bunch of free yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, how else are you going to kick the door in without yeah. new shoes? Yeah. Right. What, what uh, have been the perks? What, <laughs> are the, what are the perks that come with coaching that you didn't know that all of a sudden happen as soon as you become a head coach? Besides shoes. No, there's like uh, there's a ton of people. It's the funniest thing um, because you have so many people like helping you to do your job. Which is completely foreign. Well, All of a sudden, not there's to like, man, by the way, huh? <laughs> <laughs> not to me. It's not like foreign to me. So oh, I mean, you have a lot of people I'm just, helping you do your job. I'm just excited to be a part of your culture. Um, no, I, I've gone about my business my whole career with no one helping me, and all of a sudden, you know, the calendar date changes, your title changes, and there's 90, um, 150 people helping you do your job. You know, so that that. That was kind of a transition. What did you think was going to be so about the job that has not been? Like, what did you imagine that you've already noticed? Okay, that's not how that's going to be. Um, now, don't get this confused with it, um, with the final output. But the day-to-day -day job is not as hard as I thought it was going to be because of the, the intrinsic motivation that you have with all the people depending on you. Mm -hmm. So like that, as well as just kind of realizing that, I, I mean, that, that was one of the biggest surprises that was like swarming me my first week is I didn't think about how many people were depending upon me and that my job was more, more than anything, it was serving them. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't think of it that way, but it was very obvious very quickly. Um, and so in that regard, it's the, it's the easiest job to get motivated for on a day-to-day -day basis. Has your sleep changed? How much do you sleep? Um, I actually sleep, I sleep a little bit more. I was kind of notorious for just burning it at both ends. Um, with regard to work, like it's stay late, start early. Um, but now there's, there's so much more connection that you have to have with people. Um, I, I feel like I can't shortchange people by being uh, a little overworked or just kind of like in that zombie mode. So um, it's kind of part of my job more to be, to get my sleep and be healthy. I, I just honestly, the, it's, it's hard to get away from um, the, what people are depending upon you to do in terms of the, to set the table. At the same time, you're also, it's a relief because if you just set the table, you're, you're not doing anything by yourself. So, um, you know, I guess that would be kind of the, you just don't really think of it, think of it in those terms. You don't, you're, you're thinking about your job but then your job is so much different than it was before. Um, and it, it's kind of hard to s grasp, you know, mm -hmm. in that regard. So Are we talking like a solid, like seven, eight hours of sleep? Because oh, I would no, prefer no, my no, coach no, no, not no. to sleep at no, all. No, no, no. I, don't, I don't want you sleeping. Or if you well, do sleep, so, with one, yeah. so, what I do, so what I do is um, I train myself uh, <laughs> sure. probably the last three weeks a break before I come back to work. I make sure five to six hours. Mm -hmm. And then... I try to stay consistent on that as best possible, um, but that way um, I, I can't ever try to touch eight. And so you don't want to get, for me, I've gotten, I've done that for years to try to get five to six so that I could prepare myself to get three if I needed to. Um, and that'll probably happen once in a while, but for the most part, I, I, I have to prioritize my health. Um, uh, ju just because it's a lot more human connection um, responsibility than really just X's and O's and trying to, 
you know, diagram how to exploit a defense. Well, you're a manager of people, right? You have yeah, to learn exactly. that one of the overwhelming parts of the job are you're not only responsible for these people, but now you have to get to know them in a way that makes them believe you care about them. I mean, I, I think the best way to do that is to care about them. And you have to do that. You can't, you, you can't keep that to yourself. And that's the way, what, what you just said is dead right. And that's exactly how I feel. But in my mind, I'm thinking about it in the terms of I can't, I can't just trivialize or take for granted that they know that. So I need to um, exhaust all avenues. And wouldn't really they distrust that? Wouldn't they think that the corporation is against them? That, uh, wouldn't, they, wouldn't there be a lot of distrust in the system that arrives at your doorstep? Just previous coaches, previous politics, Previous uh, this, people this in the This is building. not your first rodeo. Absolutely right. That's exactly what happens. You have to earn the trust. It's not given to you, and you're breaking down. Um, you're breaking down the weight and uh, all all of the really the burdens. And there's a lot of harboring of of past issues that are projected upon you. That as long as you're aware of them, that's fine. I totally understand that. So then at the front end, you just explain, hey. Don't, don't project past things onto me. You just make them aware that they're doing it because they're not aware that they're doing it. And then you just have to be consistent every day. And um, yeah, it, it would be borderline impossible if you just decided one day to, to care and invest in people. But, you know, they, they get exhausted of denying it if you just hit them over the head with it every day, you know? Well, but, what do you think about coaching through fear, right? There's, it's a new player, you're a young coach, you're a new model, and it doesn't sound like you would be, that you can find the places where discipline is important without craving respect more than fear. No, the, the and, I, and I think that's a common thing that people kind of misguide. I don't think it has to be that way. I don't think fear has to be, um, uh, the strongest motivator. I think the the way I look at it is they um, people want to be good. They want to feel good about whatever they're doing. If you show them um, how or show them the things that they need to do, but then yet keep them accountable, I can um, you know make things fun. But you can you could ask the players that um, have gotten used to me now since I, since I've been here. I will not hesitate to hold people accountable. And you don't have to do it through MFing. You can do it like, hey, here, here's the issue. You're doing this. And you show it in front of the team and say, this is effing your teammate. Because if you don't do this, then you explain, then this happens to your teammate. This guy just, because you ran the wrong route, your quarterback just his helmet just flew off because he got hit so hard because you didn't know your assignment. Um, it put this person in this position, those types of things I think is for me, it's made sense. Um, it's very natural for me because I don't want, um, to pretend to be something I'm not. Um, and I think the bottom line is people, um, all people really are driven by very similar things, especially, in professional sports, you're looking at a bunch of people um, working within the organization, a bunch of players playing, all of which have done countless number of things, have been scratching and clawing to be in that position. So, okay, what if you can keep them there or have them flourish? If you show them that, that you can, I, I feel like they'll follow you anywhere. And, that, and so that's kind of how I how I really approach the entire situation. Who are your leadership mentors? Like, do you have leadership principles? Do you read about leadership? How do you define leadership differently? That's a bunch of different questions. Um, all good though, all good questions. Um, I would say, you know, I, I, I learned a piece of leadership for, from every person I've kind of worked under um, in coaching. Uh, and along, along the way, I, I was fortunate enough to be around a lot of different types of coaches um, that I kind of took aspects 
that were true to them. And the overall lesson was to me is I better damn, be damn sure than I myself. To me, I, I guess I could categorize, I, I, you know, I, I like to read. I, I, everything that I read is nonfiction. Um, a lot of it's sociology, but then there's various types of stuff. But I think I could categorize um, leadership in maybe two different broad themes. And that would be service is one and sacrifice is the other. The, the one thing that um, I think that a lot of people get lost in the whole process when you're a leader is the burden or the pressure of it. When in reality, you can kind of alleviate that pressure by understanding, no, 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 you're, you're trying to achieve a goal with a bunch of people. Yes, your name's on it. So, but in reality, you were trying, your job is to serve all of those people whom you're doing it with to maximize who they are or maximize their output or just maximize them as people. Um, but then there's a whole nother component that's like the sacrifice aspect where that's what's so, that's why the sacrifice part is so innate to me since I've been doing the job, that's where it is easier than I thought because you, you know, people are depending, like it is super easy to be a head coach on the first day or the first day of OTAs or the first day of training camp where it's like, yeah, we haven't done anything. Um, well, what about when people are tired? What about when people don't feel like doing stuff? Um, that, that's where it's like, for me, that's my time. The adversity, what, whatever that is, whether that's a um, couple bad practices, whether in the, in the future it's, three game losing streak, whether it's what, whatever that is, that's where you cut your teeth, I think, as a, as a leader, because that's when people need you. And that, that is so obvious to me. Um, every day I walk in the building, when, when people are you know, getting there early, uh, you have um, you know, people in the office making food, or make, in the building making food at 6 a.m., trainers here at, um, you know, 4.45 or 5, preparing for the day, this whole moving orchestration, well, if, if that doesn't motivate you to do your job the best when they're looking at you to, for guidance, I mean, what would motivate you? So that, that part of it has been natural. I didn't really know it would be, you know? I, I, I knew I'd be able to give maximum effort longer than um, a lot of people just because I'm pretty driven and I've been trying to get to this, this point for a long, long time. But I didn't, I didn't realize how blatantly obvious it would be that, wow, this is, yeah, I, don't, I can't afford to just go through the motions one day. That, that is not, that is, that is, that entitlement is something that I would disgust me that, you know, here I am asking all these people to move in this direction. I better be a catalyzer and not an inhibitor, you know? Mm -hmm. So You want the players and the organization, but the players more so, I would imagine, right? To feel like you, coach, you're as invested, or if not more invested, in the process and the winning than they are, right? That's, that's essentially what you're getting. Uh, they uh, feel I that. mean, to a degree, or I think people just need the acknowledgement that like, hey, everyone is sacrificing, and this is everyone's dream. Everyone benefits if we do well. Everyone has to take it under the chin if we do poorly. And there's not, I, I won't ever, I haven't for one day, nor will I ever, act like I do anything. I don't score a point. I don't, I don't do anything on the field. So quite literally, I don't do anything alone. We do stuff together. And that, that ownership of the, the cog and the wheel, so to speak, I think, um, I think that, that goes a long way. Um, so I don't really, the, the players absolutely are important. Um, it would be hard to prioritize. I, I, I just, I think that what I've learned in this league, it is super hard to win. The parity is insane. So how do you have a competitive advantage? Well, all the teams that I've been on that have won were the tightest teams. 
So that's my focus, and that comes from everywhere. If you enjoy, if you enjoy coming to work, if, it's, if there's an atmosphere that is available to you where you can be yourself that's liberating, now you can get more investment by people, maybe investment that they, they might not even know they had because they want to perpetuate and have this thing flourish and they own that, you know? And, and just bringing light to stuff that may or may not be obvious. Um, I, uh, it's, it's part of my job as well. Um, but I think those type of things, I didn't necessarily know going into it. Shoot, um, last time I was on air with you guys, I didn't know that, what, I didn't really have that scope yet. Um, but just working, um, you know, in the building day in, day out and, and owning that, that aspect of it, it's been, it, it is a clear motivator that never goes away. And it's just very, um, I don't know, natural. It, it, it feels relieving because all of the, all of the things that I see as leadership, um, with regard to this position, um, it, it, it seems pretty common sense to me. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you read a lot. Quick question. Would you consider audiobooks reading? No. No, you, because you completed no. an audio it's book. Do you get to say you read a book? No, by definition, that would be listening. Thank um, you. But for me, that and the reason why I don't, which I, I'm not trying to nitpick, but for me, like I, I, I get stuff out of reading with the internal monologue. Mm. That's mm. how. That's how I digest. I, I kind of learned it when I went to college. I, I found ways to get like an A minus in every class in high school. Because my, my mom hit me with this motivating factor of a new car if I got straight A's. And then I started to notice that I could get into colleges. And I wasn't really into learning yet. Um, so I didn't read that much. Um, and then one, once I got to college, it was, uh, I was, there was plenty of pencils sharper than mine at Yale. So then I had to like, and I became a history major. So I started reading. And my, like that, my vocabulary gain was just skyrocketed once I started reading. Not really an answer to his question, though. Like, <laughs> I, I feel that's like I more learned definition years, for like, reading, but he's yeah. like, how about we modernize that? Yeah, a because little now bit? I gotta like add all this context no. and say like, well, actually, I didn't no. read the book. I listened to it in my car. But we both got the same. I didn't say that. I didn't say that was the answer you're looking for. Mm. I wasn't just looking but for the answer. It wasn't no. the better answer. I wasn't right. even looking for your answer. I was right. just looking for affirmation. <laughs> that's all really. I was looking that's for. That's all I was looking for. Just get it. Just wanted to tell him. As a three, as a fifth reader. You'll learn, like this, you'll learn this quickly about me. If you're going to try to predict my response, you're going to fail. No. He's, he's, th <laughs> he's taking shortcuts is yeah. what he's yeah, doing. I mean, right. right. Do the work. There's so nothing wrong word. with that. I, I do the work. He's, say, he's saying there's, yeah. there's, when you read, you got to absorb, comprehend, yeah. add yeah. context, yeah. stop. You say, well, in Mike's check defense, your phone for a second. You lose In Mike's defense, you might retain better reading. He might retain better listening. Also, I, mean, I, don't like, I got lazy. People like, are the different, thing, coach. Reading. Yeah, you yeah. got to reach different people through leadership. Everyone's a little <laughs> bit different. The, 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 this wild card audio is, I mean, sound is sight is blowing my mind, and I'm not sure I can conform to this. <laughs> well, here, here's my real question. You mentioned what was different about being a head coach that you didn't necessarily anticipate, though you've uh, worked for several head coaches. What about being the head coach of the Miami Dolphins caught you by surprise? What about this market, this fan oh, base? Oh, that was a trip. Yeah. Okay, so... I, I had just gone through, like, I, I was in California with the 49ers. They had a real strong fan base. It was pretty notable that we went down to L.A. and took over their stadium a couple times. Hmm. And because Miami, I just, for whatever reason, I just projected L.A. <laughs> to Miami. Yeah. And I hadn't, it's one of the only, I'd been in six of the eight divisions. One of the two I hadn't been in is AFC East. So, like, I was... Cool, Miami, that's awesome. I get to go to a warm weather place. And then I got here and I was like, what? And then, and then on top of that, I hadn't done the math, but it's been 22 years since they won a playoff game. And I'm piecing this together. I'm like, this is, this is unbelievable gold. Like, how did I get this opportunity? Because you have this, this fan base that is just thirsty and they haven't, and they haven't won a playoff game in 22 years. You talk about, an unbelievable opportunity to have to what, what, I mean, what a dream it would be to pursue and achieve 
and then not have, there's so many fan bases that feel entitled. That will not be the case in Miami. Yeah, like that went out the window. They, 20 they, years they ago. will appreciate, and it's like, wow, this. Is, and I talk, I talk to the players about it all the time. I'm just open with it. Like, this is the opportunity on the table that you chase, because this will be a once in a lifetime thing. You'll remember this team over every team. We have a chance. This, you know, while we're here this year and next year and every year after that, we have a chance to do something. You have a chance for a year in your life or to mean something more than every other year. You know, 22, 2022, you know, that, that's, that's what I got overwhelmed with. And it was blatantly obvious, but I had no idea about it. It was really, really exciting, um, you know, to the point that uh, I, maybe you guys read, but I dropped Elway and, and I'm a Marino guy now. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mind blower. <laughs> uh, uh, sacrilegious yeah, to my, from from to my hand tree. You can't. I mean, people would understand. You can. Oh, no, it's it's more like my high school friends. You know, um, just uh, sent, just messaging me very very derogatory things. Um, He's got hey. a smaller office than you. Dan Marino's got a lot smaller office. Isn't that than wild? You, I, know. I don't know how I tricked the organization. That has to be to weird that. to you, right? <laughs> yeah, that has to be weird. To <laughs> you. Yeah. No, and then when he when he talks to me, he's like, "Hey, uh, you cool if I come?" No, he actually says very nice. Would it be okay with you if I um, come to the? Coach's staff meeting today, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I, hey, I was just gonna, I was just, yeah. I was, I was just, just gonna, tell him like Ace Ventura. I was just gonna ask, an answer. I just go. Ace no, Ventura. no. He asked me if it was okay with me if he went to the quarterback meetings, and I'm like, <laughs> dude, you humble. <laughs> Bless your soul. Like, what? <laughs> that's, that's cool. Yeah. What have you learned about Tua? What do you know about Tua? What do you see in Tua that the rest of us cannot see? Well, it's it started with just the bottom line. I, I know through my own experience that the for you to maximize yourself, it only can help. It can't hurt to have support and belief. So I started with that. But then when I started, like when I first got here, when I first met him and took in his personality, you know, there was a there was a guy that was very guarded with scars. Um, and then I saw an insanely accurate quarterback with a cool feel on, on tape, um, that, you know, didn't, whether it was a, you know, I'm not going to get into that other stuff, but I, I don't think he was put in the best position necessarily. And then fast forward to this off season, there was one moment in particular that, um, to had a foundation, um, event. The Luau? Yeah. And so I went and attended that. And it was the damnedest thing. This, this guy that was quiet, that, um, you know, you could tell he was trying to please, but just feeling out how you wanted him to act. Then he jumps on stage with, like, um, with, with uh, some bongos in the background and is, is dancing with this glow, the, you know, chest out, like, confidence, bravado that was, like, it... it it was like magnetic. And I was like, that's it. That is the spirit of the athlete that we, if we can bring out on that field, that's how you can play the quarterback position the best way. Because the court, I mean, just imagine every game you play, every time your team has the football, you are assigned to take it from the center and you, even if it's a run play, you have to take the right track. You have to, you have to um, communicate to the players everything to do. And your response, I mean, that, it, and to go through that type of existence with that burden and responsibility on your shoulders, for you not to be your most co confident, authentic self, how can you do that and stay sane? You know? So to me, I, I saw that and. That was my immediate job, was to get him like he was on stage, just with his aura, because his skill set's crazy. I mean, the dude is right-handed. You hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. He's right-handed, yeah. yep. and he throws he lefty, yeah. and when he throws the ball, every lefty I've ever been with, the ball kind of tails like this. I don't know why, it's something with science that I don't, I don't try mm -hmm. to 
digest. His does it. It's the most accurate, catchable ball I've ever seen. So for me, in the way I've learned football and some of the stuff that we got really good at in San Francisco was yards after the catch and, and all of those things, um, which is maximized by ball placement on these things. The most accurate, catchable ball you've ever seen. I mean, yeah. yeah. Kind of checks oh. out with the stops. Yeah, no, I just went through it. Yeah, I, yeah. Right. Um, but from there then, you, you're, it's your responsibility to make him a star, no? I mean, it's to maximize everything he has. So my job is to make sure that his best years as a football player are, are right in front of him right now, ever, for him. That's, that's, but, but that's my job with everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't always succeed in that. That's, that's not the issue. I don't really care what happens. My job is to try. And, and so he has these skills, um, you know, that I'm not going to say in the league ever or ever. He's not the, that he's the most accurate. I'm saying what I've witnessed if I was going to catch that football, that would be the accurate and most catchable. Mm -hmm. So how can we make that into good quarterback play? Mm -hmm. You know, you have this, and that's his job too. And, um, but you're, you're sitting there, and I just know for him to be the quarterback that um, he, he himself wants to be, that harness stage presence needed to be on the football field. I think that's what... When his teammates are talking about him as of late, yeah. I think that's what you're seeing is that he is, his personality is kind of, um, it, it's coming out on the football field in the way it should, in an authentic way, not forced. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about lead. We want you to lead all the time. Um, what does that mean? Um, people interpret it as I need to yell at people. No, you just need to be yourself and the bottom line is you can do it in a million different ways. For him, his teammates just need to see him give it his all every day. And then in his authentic self, when he's annoyed at a receiver or running back or whatever, and he says something, guess what? They'll listen. There's a, uh, there's a video clip that kind of exploded on social media. It's him underthrowing to re-kill. And what I'm wondering is how does that happen? And is that person still with the organization? <laughs> like, whoever released that thing. I mean, that's a terrible job. Well, no, so... Here's a breaking news. I released it with the intent to create more unnecessary storylines because I was bored. Uh, have you seen him throw righty? Like, <laughs> I haven't. I keep forgetting. Like, there's a couple other things in my mind, so I, I have. But I, I haven't. But I me meant to like force him to and just like laugh at his inability to because it, it makes no sense. It's a hell of a it's gadget crazy. play. Yeah, yes. <laughs> he just starts rolling right. Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing. It is. You gotta unleash that. Yeah. Uh, um, do you do you have stuff that keeps you up at night? Um. You know, the stuff that keeps me up at night is when I recognize that there's, there's something that the team needs to hear or that I need to do, and I can't wait for that the next day to start. So I go, it's cyclical. It's not, because I'm, the way I look at the world is like, it's in one of our team rules that like the, the game of life, the game of football, it's not, avoiding adversity. That's not it at all. It's thriving under adversity. So one of our rule mantras is adversity is opportunity. So like the only time you'd really lose sleep is if like something bad happened that day um, in whatever regards. Well, what happens to me is when I identify that, that's when I'm like, yes, this is the moment we need to, I can't wait to do X, Y, or Z the next day. And then I'm going through that process about what I'm going to say, and then it just goes on repeat. That's where I struggle, is because it I'm like, stop mm -hmm. repeating. But it just it just goes in uh, in circles. Can you take us through the opportunity to get Tyree Kill? Like how involved you were in it, your level huh. of enthusiasm, yeah, what you imagined, mm. what you imagined possible yeah. with a threat that yeah. is the most unique uh, in, in the NFL. I'll take I'll take you exactly through it. So. 
I can't remember if it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It was the weekend. And been grinding. It was like the first afternoon that I was going to get off work. And I was going to go see, you know, I have a, um, a two-year-old in October, um, daughter, uh, Ayla, and my wife, Katie. They're down here, and they're like um, at, the, at the W Hotel because um, we we just got here. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, hey, honey, I'm going to come home probably three. And she's like, three? Awesome. Like, totally geeked. <laughs> and then Chris walks in. He's like, hey. <laughs> so I just got a call from the Chiefs talking about Tyreek Hill. And I'm like, what? So I'm like, uh, this is why I'm not a GM. I'm like, Tell them they can have everything. <laughs> you know? um, I do the same thing. But then once I once I did that, I was like, "Wow, this is pretty irresponsible. I better check the t-. like because I'm watching." But like, I, I'm of habit of like, "All right, well, I need to watch." It's not like I was watching Tyreek, like the way that I evaluate free agents. You know, I thought he was untouchable, so I'm like, "I better turn this stuff on." So then it was like three o'clock. Uh, mind you, I'm not in negotiations or anything. Um, you know, Chris is just, we're just communicating about what is this dude worth But you're whatever. telling him you want him badly. That Immediately, he that, like, so that he goes he back to the office, whole he gets on the phone. He can tell you that one gave up all three uh, And then, uh, so then I turn on the tape and I start with last year, 2021. And I watched, um, started with every target and then it turned into every pass of that year. And then it turned into for the last three years. And turn the page, it's eight o'clock. My wife's ripping me. And I'm like, honey, hold on. Let me get home. I'll explain. <laughs> but like, uh, and this was like my day off. It was a weekend of You some got sort. lost in five hours of. Dude, of it was like, hypnotized. I couldn't stop. And then, then I was in too deep. Right. <laughs> but between then three I became stressed. <laughs> like, we have to have him. You have to have him, right. Yeah. But between three and eight, was there any communication to the wife? Like, hey, sorry, I missed the No, time. that's the, <laughs> the biggest issue. Lost in it. No, you because I, I'm notorious it. for that. Like, I am a present guy. Mm hmm. The cost of that, uh, when you're present all the time, is there's no time for a phone. <laughs> so I don't respond. To, I don't check my phone or whatever, especially when I'm getting floated Tyree Hill. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I just went into it. And, yeah, let's just say that my wife was not pleased that I just went into a black cloud for whatever and then came out five hours later. It was like, hey. Um, but I smoothed it over when I kind of told her um, what I was doing. So fast forward to... It was a long, long couple days. It had to be a weekend or whatever. And, you know, every couple moments I'm checking, hey, what's going on? I get no news. Um, then there's like, hey, it's not looking good. Then it's looking great. So, you know, probably I think it might have been a Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember what day, but I'm sitting in my office. And, you know, there was a there was a point in the process where it was like, all right, well, you might have to. Um, you might have to kind of win Tyreek over and get him, to get him to accept, accept the trade or whatever. Um, There's a couple teams interested, I don't know. So I was getting my mind right to recruit, right? And I explained to him why this would be the best decision for us and him. <laughs> uh, and he, uh, so <laughs> I'm lost in probably some more Tyreek tape, sitting there just watching film and then um, Brandon Shore comes in my office on the phone. I think um, Ann might be trailing. I don't know. But Chris Greer's at, at a pro day at Ohio State. And he's like, and he shows me the phone. Talk to him. And so then I get on the phone and, I'm, and I just immediately go into recruit mode. Like, like hyperspeed. This is, you know, exactly, um, you know, your skill set. We can... Uh, we can feature this. This is something that um, you'd be paired with a with a guy that really feature your skill set. We can think we can do X, Y, or Z. And I'm going ham. This is all I got. I'm sh shooting shooting every shot that I have <laughs> deep into it. And like 20 seconds or 30 seconds into me just not giving an iota of time for him to speak, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, coach. I'm coming. It was already done. And I was just and like, you're selling. I was like, what? Yeah, I was selling. I was like, what? 
<laughs> and I just freaked out. I think I yelled. It was the only time I yelled in the office. It was it was a cool time because it was like, uh, yeah, I just would have liked a little uh, forewarning before I just went straight recruit mode to close the deal. So non quarterback position, he is how high on the list of guys you would have wanted if you're talking about dream offense type stuff. No, I I I, I quite honestly thought he was one of the untouchable guys that you couldn't get, um, but then. It's ironic you say that exact phrase because you're bringing me back to right when, before I have a time to digest that it's even going to happen. When he comes in and tells me that Tyree, you know, the Chiefs have talked to him, and I said, Chris, that's like one of the only non quarterbacks that you do whatever it takes. Like, bar, you know, and so he, it was, I am, that's exactly what I thought. I thought about that list and, okay, because you're in your mind, you're thinking, okay, well, what is this going to take? Um, historical trade value, what people have gone for, you know, I was, or, I was immediately rattling off, okay, what well, back in, in the day when we had to get an unproven um, starting quarterback, what are that? That was two seconds um, with the Atlanta Falcons and Matt Schaub. Okay. Well, uh, most re I was going through all the trades and I'm like, yeah, this is one of those guys that's whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, historical precedent for a receiver match that. Yeah. Mike Ryan has, he wants to geek out with you a yeah. little bit. So I'm a recovering Browns fan, no longer supporting them, <laughs> fan free yeah. agent. But yeah. 2015, 14. Uh, two, well, that, that mid 2000s era, we, it was a lot of positivity. They were, we were checking in the hunt standings late into mm -hmm. the year, which was, you know, not common for us. There was one play that worked every game. You guys kept going to it. And it defies logic. Brian Hoyer rolling out, throwing totally across his body, across the field, and there was always somebody open. Normally it was Gary Barnage, but there was always someone uh -huh. there. How did that play always work? What is it about this offense that gets people in space so well? Does it start at the line of scrimmage? Uh, this offense, the space is created at the line of scrimmage, yes. And it starts with just the idea that defenses – want to, the, every defense, regardless of structure, they want to compress the field. They want to defend less space. So whether it's a gap assignment or an alignment, they're trying to compress stuff, which is why we, you know, it's the way I learned football in my first year in coaching in 2005, is that's why it starts with outside zone running ball, running ball because our principles were trying to, we're trying to just attack the defense and when you're attacking the defense in the run game, for them to start it, the principle, for, for them to defend it is they have to overplay that, which in turn creates space. That, that, that starting point, um, the line of scrimmage in general, is, is why there is space and kind of what we try to major in. Um, back then, that was a, there, there was one, uh, one concept off of that bootleg you're talking about that uh, the, the NFL hadn't really caught up to yet. So um, we, didn't, we weren't opposed to going to the well again. Um, but the NFL is very cyclical. So eventually, I mean, guys get paid too. So Eventually, Gary Barnage wasn't yeah. open. Yeah. Well, Josh Gordon they came in and it, it was just... No, but, then, but so then you have to figure out the next thing. But all the, all the principles um, from every place that we've been starting in Houston and Washington... Um, then, uh, or was I after that? That was, uh, then it was Cleveland. Yeah. Then it was Atlanta then San Francisco. It's all started with that principle. Do you believe this offense has more talent and options for space than any you've had? Um, I, I believe it is capable of doing things, um, that are very dependent on like really right where, where we're at now. I wouldn't. It's hard for me to say relative to other years because you 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 end up talking about other years with the finality of the team, and on the best teams, you're always getting better. So like, it has it has the potential for week two of preseason to be as good as the other offenses I've been in that were pretty good. Yeah. That to me doesn't really mean anything. It has to do with a lot of people continuing to work because that's where you make your merit in this league. Is you, you don't, 
you don't have a flashy play and then shut it down or you don't have a feel good practice and then just like, all right, we're good. It is so contingent. And I wouldn't want to do disjustice to all the daily work that takes to be that great. So for, you know, I, I have no problem saying a guy's accurate because that, that is, that doesn't mean he's, has a high completion percentage. That just means he wants to throw it to this guy right here. He can do that. Right. Um, but I, I, I do refrain from comparing final products to a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I, I feel very confident um, in the people. And uh, there, I think there's things that we could do that would be unique to this, this certain platoon. Um, but to, uh, I would be doing injustice to a lot of hard work if I try that, to compare it to that's what's product. Twitter is all about right yeah. like so you you say that Tua delivers the most catchable ball then the internet and Twitter finds out that you coach an NFL MVP and then it will become you know Tua better than Matt Ryan so the internet will do all the work for you no so yeah that's and I, I mean I have no problem as long as the internet comes back and asks me and be like yeah <laughs> Matt Ryan was the MVP of the National Football League yeah. so there's a lot of things that go into quarterback play um, and I, I think he had 117 rating that year. Um, so he's, he was, that was definitely the best year of quarterback play that I've ever been around. That was insane. So I like to grind through the film as well. I'm a coach, by the way. I don't know if you know that. So uh, a couple I of coaches. I can tell. Yeah, a couple by of coaches wisdom. cutting it up. Yeah, lacrosse. I mean, not football, not the NFL. We won uh, two national championships. So, uh, but I do take game <laughs> notes. I, do, I take game notes. And <laughs> so I wrote, that's... listen. I want to make sure I get the verbiage right, so I wrote these down. These are game notes after the game. I've grinded through the film of your first preseason game. So much of your offense is about sequencing, uh, setting up plays down the road. What's the challenging part of integrating the wide zone under center with the, uh, with the RPO game we saw last year? How do you integrate those two? Um, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Man. Yeah, it is a pretty <laughs> good question. Don't let him say it's a good question. It is a pretty good question. Well, um, I know what he's saying. The, and... and being a coach, the, the one thing that you'd appreciate is that, so the RPO game is half-based on outside zone anyway. Because when you're giving the ball off, you know, yeah, your backside is adjust, but now you're just adjusting the backfield and the quarterback. So if, if your players can understand and work together in unison and in concert in outside zone, it still gives you the availability to overlap concepts if you choose to. Now, you know, I, we ran plenty of RPOs in, in San Francisco. Um, uh, I think that's where we started in Atlanta, I think. But that's been, that's been part of our offense as well. So it, there is a semblance of teaching. Um, and so th that you are afforded that ability if you choose to use it. Um, so, uh, if you're talking to any and every defensive coordinator in the National Football League, everything's up. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I don't think the answer correct. I don't yeah, think that, that is the correct it. answer. Yeah. I don't think the last time we had talked to you that you had actually seen how bad the offensive line play was last year on this team. No, you, it was my first day, so I had gotten a dabble of um, watching last year's tape. But um, yeah, uh, it was there was more digesting before free agency hit to kind of figure out um, what, you know, what direction we wanted to go. The, re the reason I asked the question is because whatever the metrics are from pro football focus on measuring these things, they allowed, they were the worst, in the time of measurement, the worst pass protection that the sport had seen since they've been doing the measurements. Are you someone who can simply bring running game with you wherever you go? There, that the offensive line and the run schemes will make it so that that offensive line is better than it was. Um, I think, I think no one person has the magic pixie dust um, to just be like run game. Um, you're you're working together with a lot of people. I think it's, I, I think the one thing that was advantageous is there was like. There was like three guys on the offensive line that we had done a deep dive on um, uh, in in the previous two drafts who we were looking at in San Francisco that I felt very comfortable with um, who they who they were. Um, I think I do have experience and reps, um, not only working on the offensive line, but 
uh, making this transition to new teams. Um, this this being my seventh different team. Um, so with a lot of help, I think I can assist in the process of making a productive run game. Um, but I, 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 again, I'm serious. I do not fancy myself as anything um, but a piece that when all is said and done, it's not because Mike McDaniel did A, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. It's because... As the head coach, he was a part of a team that did so. And I think I know what it looks like. And I think we have um, the right people to invest, the right people to do what it takes of, through investment to have a productive run game and outside zone. Mike, did he win? Did he win you over? Or you yeah, know, we can still... talk about the audiobook thing a little bit yeah. later on. He lost but... you there. He yeah, wasn't well, trying to impress you reading. there. Yeah. <laughs> do you have. I'll read it, and by read it, I mean I'll listen to there it. There we go. <laughs> See? Points back. Points back. Do you guys have anything else that you'd like to ask the coach? We appreciate your time. We appreciate that you've given us so much time over the last yeah, couple of months. It's my pleasure. I, I just, uh, I'll just tell you this, um, and Mike will be disappointed because he wants me to ask an X's and O's question. Perhaps I'll get to it, but do you take this as a compliment? My wife rarely does this. We were watching the game the other night. She said, uh, who is that? Mm. with the Dolphins' new head coach. Now, I know my wife well enough to know it's when she's good. asking me that. She thinks the person's good-looking. Smoldering. Yeah. So Smoldering. I said to her, why do you ask? She said, sneaky good-looking. Oh, sneaky good-looking. I don't good know looking. if that's a compliment. Ah. Sneaky good-looking. <laughs> right. <laughs> she said you're good-looking, but sneaky uh, good-looking. What does that mean? <laughs> I, well, exactly. You know, you've I should have brought her here. You know, you've yeah. insulted him. Yeah. Man. Yeah. It was going so well. Yeah, you, you, you had me well, a good-looking. I mean, blame her. I mean... Tell her half thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the time, I Coach. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good story. We did get lost in yeah. the uh, we got lost in the middle of that somehow. Sneaky good looking is a compliment. Sneaky. Sneaky good looking. Yeah. Uh, but it's like you take Just off take the glass, you take the glasses off and then you go. You what know. happens so if the next game, if I'm wearing contacts, you know why? Yeah. Okay, good for, for I'm Abby, trying to lose my the sneaky parts. Yes. <laughs> Just overtly good looking. Smoldering. <laughs> yeah, he's actually not terrible.